Yeah. yeah. Uh, good, good morning, morning everyone, everyone, and welcome, welcome to, to the next step of York. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, we bless the Lord that we can be in your house today again with uh, a message uh, from God. We are linking heaven and earth these days, uh, the days of the pandemic uh, that is running worldwide. And uh, we're looking for God's grace, for God's comfort, for God's power. And also, especially, we're looking for his guidance. So today, we are going to share uh, the message of the of of the word of God for you, and uh, we pray that uh, uh, you could be blessed, that you could be enabled, and that you could uh, come out and encourage. And I'm, I'm going to pray in true. So I'm going to ask you where you are to please bow your heads and uh, let us let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we love you, and we thank you for your love. We thank you for your care. We well, thank you for Jesus and for one more opportunity to listen to your voice, to be encouraged by it, and to have light to walk in this life. These are difficult days, Father, but you have been always so, so good. It is so good to be able to call you Father, to call you our shepherd. We bless you, Father, and we commit ourselves to you in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Blessed, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Lord. Excuse me. <clears throat> Today, we have a theme that we think is very, very important for the moment in time that we are living. Uh, and it is heaven's citizenship. Uh, we're going to talk about heaven. We're going to talk about a theme that is um, a little difficult for some people. Uh, but let, let, us, let us get the spirit of the Word of God in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Uh, it says that our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So, you know, one of the great challenges for Jesus' mission on earth, I think it was our traumatized faith. We had... Serious issues to believe the work that God could do in us. Yes, on that time and still we have those issues. So the new patterns of beliefs as a result of sin that we embrace imply darkness and incapacity to believe uh, what doesn't fit in our system. And in uh, and and that, that struggle, we turn our hearts, we turn our trust to something else. You go to Romans chapter 1, and it talks about trusting or worshiping uh, the creation instead of the creator. There is a vivid story that reflects that perfectly in John chapter 3. Uh, our Lord Jesus is trying to explain the work of restoration that God does in one life and uh, trying to explain it to a gentleman called Nicodemus that came to visit uh, uh, Jesus privately. And uh, this guy is a master. I mean, he's with the top guys and the leaders of the faith community there, and uh, Jesus talks to him about the work of salvation, and he calls it the new birth, and, uh, 
And when Jesus calls the work of God new birth right there, the master of the law, Nicodemus, he just got stuck. Let, let, let us take a look at it to, in John chapter 3 and verse 3 and on. It says that Jesus told him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. There it is. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly cannot enter, uh, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where is it going. So it is with, the, it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You know, evidently, <laughs> Jesus is saying that this new birth is a work of the Holy Spirit on a person's spirit, on a person's soul, on a, on a person's spiritual reality. But uh, he's giving this illustration of the work of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit we cannot see, but he makes the work. And he says, look, look at the wind. You know, we don't see the wind, but we see the effect of the wind on whatever it touches. So, and, 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 and the Lord then says, that, that is the way that it happens. That is the way that God transforms people. You don't see the Spirit itself, himself, but you see the work that the Spirit does in one's person. And after all this explanation and illustration, still Nicodemus says, how can this be? That's his answer. That's his answer. So we, it's obvious that we resist what we cannot handle or what we cannot produce with our own hands, that we cannot see with our own eyes. And then we realize that our faith is not in God. You know, our story of Nicodemus and Jesus, it came to the point that Jesus said to Nicodemus, a master of the law, I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe as I speak of heavenly things? Quite a challenge. I mean, the Lord Jesus is saying, come on, people. I am illustrating with things that you can touch, with things that you can uh, experience every day and you don't understand. I think that the problem here is not uh, understanding. Maybe the problem here is faith is a matter of where we have our faith. So I personally say that today I have the challenge to speak about heaven. And there comes the challenge. Because, because there, there comes, comes a trauma. trauma. And I ask, are we going to allow God to be God and be able to do what he pleases? Are we going to recognize that we are talking about the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one that made it all and he has the answers? Are we, go all, are we going to just get stuck like Nicodemus and say, how was that? How can this be? Are we going to believe in God? I have the conviction that our duty is not entirely to understand God, 
but to believe him. It is not to be able to uh, inquire the death of the Lord, but to put our trust in him. That is a different concept. One of the most recognized atheists of our era, Stephen, Haw uh, Stephen Hawking, said that heaven is just a fatal story for those afraid of dark. When I read that, I, I, I said, well, that sounds like a very attractive idea for those who want who want to reject God. And I say to, well, he is not alive anymore, but I say to him or whoever embraces this sentence that evidently darkness was a familiar context for his reasoning. And it's incredible that so many people find this silly statement a justification for the lack of facts or scientific discipline, and of course, a justification for continuing to walk in darkness about our reality. It becomes a matter of preference, and the preference continues to be rejection to God. Yes, it's a silly statement. There is no, there is no connection with a rational, there is no connection to uh, a serious scientific investigation to conclude that kind of statement. But if we like it, is that we're just trying to reject God. We have made a choice, the Church of Christ, we believe God. And we want to receive his revelation that will make us wise for salvation in Christ Jesus. So I would say, let us address the issue of heaven. Let us address uh, what this, uh, the scripture is giving us here about it. Let us open our hand, uh, hearts to God's reasons and revelation. And uh, remember uh, that we are in Philippians chapter 3. And uh, now I'm going to expand a little bit uh, the frame of the text that we read. Uh, we're going to read starting on verse 17, Philippians 3. Join together in following my example, says uh, Paul, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their glory is is their shame. Their mind is set to earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And uh, as we read this scripture, we find this battle between what uh, is called citizens of heaven and uh, enemies of the cross of Christ. How do we consider ourselves is the matter of the issue. But let's... let's get the sense of both uh, positions here according to the scriptures. Citizens of heaven. Paul is saying there are people that live as enemies of the cross of Christ. 
while our citizenship is in heaven. So the, ch the challenge here is the reality of heaven, the evidence itself in the lifestyle of a group that Paul calls enemies of the cross of Christ. And who he calls uh, enemies of the cross of Christ. In this text, there are three um, characteristics and a fourth strong statement about what identifies this type of people. And he says, number one, that the enemies of the cross of Christ, their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. And their destiny is destruction. So let us, let us uh, chew a little bit this. As their minds are set on earthly thing, because that, that's, that is the, the final statement, as their mind are set on earthly things, only the things of that context, the earth, only things that happen here make sense for those people. So heaven is, is an excluded reality. And uh, they framed their... Their frame of action is feelings, is what they feel. It's, a, it's, sensor, uh, it's about their senses. It says that their God is their stomach. So if it feels good, then it's good. That's about it. Uh, no need to get approval from God for anything. Uh, their, their glory is their, is their shame. So there's nothing about your kingdom come, your will be done, that is irrelevant. Uh, it's about my own merits. Their minds don't have room for the new birth of the fruit of the Spirit because those are things that my eyes cannot see. Those are things that my uh, sense of smell cannot get. I cannot touch with my hands. So there is only room for earthly things. Do you understand? Many people that I have known in life, they leave kind of a decent life, socially speaking. <clears throat> and uh, they um, try to do their best. But when it comes to their spiritual reality, well, I must be doing good because I haven't killed nobody. And I know a guy that thought like that. And it's the guy that you have in front of you right now is me. I thought, I don't kill, I don't steal. What's the problem? The problem is, or was, my ignorance about the work of God. My problem is that I tried to limit God and I tried to put God in a box saying, if I don't feel you, you're not there. If I don't touch you, you are not real. And that is a problem. Because when God talks about heaven, so what? That is just fruit of my imagination. And like uh, Hawking said, probably something to uh, be used. Um, to, to help those that are afraid of darkness. But that's not the reality. It's not a good picture, especially because of the end of the play. You know what is the end of the play? It says that their destiny 
is destruction. So I'm just living out of what I like, what makes me feel good. My stomach gives my God whatever he asks for, I give. And uh, my glory, my gold, my values is just my shame, is my own recognition, nothing about God, nothing about his kingdom, nothing about his will. My destiny then becomes destruction. The destiny of those is destruction. And uh, their minds is set only on earthly things. That turns us into an enemy of the cross of Christ. That turns us into something that do not appreciate, do not value the cross of Christ. And much less the goal of the cross of Christ, that the goal it is to take us to heaven. Heaven, it is to uh, turned us into another kind of citizens. The citizens that are looking, that long for, <clears throat> that have their bondages of love with the motherland, but the motherland is heaven. And the dreams of this life is to go back home, to go to heaven. Did you figure that crowd, the enemies of the cross of Christ? And how much does that look like our society? But well, let's talk about <clears throat> the other group that I believe is more important, and that is the group where you and I should belong to. And it is those who believe in Christ, those who believe his promises and those who has be have become citizens of heaven. <clears throat> those are different. The citizens of heaven are identified in this dynamic in, in a different way. <clears throat> Number one, on verse 17, it says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, <clears throat> keep your eyes on those who live as we do. And you know how, how we call that? Is that the citizens of heaven on earth, they are disciples. Disciples, people that keep some eyes on the models and follow and learn, imitate. Oh, that is against my pride. I want to be me. That's what the world is preaching to us. Don't let anybody uh, uh, to tell you that anything of you is wrong because you are the best. Well, we are called to be disciples, and, and those who appreciate heaven, those who look for heaven, those who believe in heaven and God's promises about it, we on earth have to be disciples. That is the expression of our faith. It is to be disciples. It is to be followers. Who should I follow? Yeah, we have a lot of objections to what God says because of this bad experience, with because of this other trauma. So, again, our traumatized faith challenges God's commands. But the citizens of heaven on earth, they are disciples. Number two, disciples that have a very clear goal in mind. Verse 20 says, we eagerly await a Savior from there, from heaven. Not any Savior, but the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the Lord Jesus Christ, who has the power to overcome death, who has the power to go to heaven and prepare a place for us, who has the power to come back and take us to his own. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We are disciples that every now and then we look at the clock and say, is he coming? Every now and then we look at the clouds and see if they are opening for the entrance of the king. Hallelujah. Those citizens of heaven are that kind of people. Disciples that long for the coming of the Savior. But you know what else we long for? And is the, the third characteristics in this scripture, and he's in verse 21, that says that Christ, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Hallelujah. There are so many references of the scriptures about that. Transformation transformation so that uh, they will be like his glorious body like his glorious body hallelujah you know look look at all these scriptures because this is not something that you know a last time resource for the situation of uh problem of the death of christ or anything no 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 first corinthians chapter 1 and verse 7 says therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our lord jesus christ to be revealed we are to wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. And in the meantime, the Lord will give us spiritual gifts so we have the power to uh, overcome our challenges and bless the world with the light of Christ. Even be support for one another. On 1 Peter 1, 13, he says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13, 14 says, In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, says 2 Timothy chapter 4, there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will a word to me on that day and not only to me but also to all who have longed for his appearance so what do you think of that and and, and i just selected a few for for uh the sake of time but citizens of heaven you know i, I am a, a an immigrant and um, many times we get together with fellow immigrants and we start talking about our land and, and talking about the places and talking about the food and talking about the people and, you know, and, uh, oh, we get all sensitive and emotional and uh, we long for uh, the good things of our land and uh, the problem that we have is that somehow we don't get into the experience with Christ to appreciate and to love heaven we don't embrace the idea we get we want a Christ we want a God that is an ATM that now when I don't have money I go there and pick it up we want a microwave that when I'm hungry, in three seconds, I got it. Then we become enemies of the cross of Christ because the cross of Christ is good for nothing. The cross of Christ is to take us home 
to take us to heaven. Jesus said, I'm going to my Father's house to prepare a place for you. If we don't get into that idea, the whole thing is down on the ground. We need to eagerly wait for him to be revealed. We need to set our hope on the grace that comes when he is revealed at his coming. We need to uh, keep the command until the appearing of the Lord. And we need to long for that appearing. Alleluia. Alleluia. It seems to say that while you live, await the coming of Christ. That is the thing. While you live, await the coming of Christ. Long for it. Be alert. Count on. Look for his coming. Those who have embraced heaven as a promise from our Lord must have it very present in their minds. So, a citizen from heaven is a disciple that is following the models that every day looks at the clouds for the possibility of the coming of the Lord. And then finally, our destiny is a transformation that is described in John chapter 3 when the apostle says, Dear friends, now we are children of God. And uh, what will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purifying themselves, purify themselves just as he is pure. I read again the scripture, today's scripture. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The question is, what does the mirror say? when I'm standing in front of it. Am I a citizen of heaven? Let us embrace heaven. Let us believe God. Let us be disciples and worship our Savior, longing for his coming every day. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for heaven. It's an idea we couldn't create, but uh, you are wonderful. And it's an evidence of your care, it's an evidence of your love once more. Help us, Lord, to not to get stuck with our limitations and our reasons and to receive your revelation, Lord. Yes, your kingdom come. Come, Lord Jesus, and may you find well to take us to be with you forever and ever and ever. Father, help us to overcome the challenges of the world and to put our trust in you. We want to walk toward heaven by your hand. Help us. We beg you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Well, I bless the name of the Lord. Uh, this week we will continue to extend this uh, theme in our daily uh, transmissions. So uh, be good, be safe, and may the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord give you his peace. You may have a good day.